today we're going to talk about um, Lyme disease and the immune system. And um, I'll start off and say Lyme and your immune system is the reason we're talking and it's the reason you're all here because the immune system and Lyme have co-evolved and Lyme has learned to actually dance very well with your immune system to allow it to survive inside you. And it, we're and at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about why this has also affected um, the difficulty in diagnosis. Because um, the I, I, it's hard to say what's more frustrating is failure to have a, a, a clear diagnosis of Lyme or um, failure to have uh, treatment work well. Um, uh, both are a source of great... Uh, uh, frustration, uh, pain, and um, just uh, have, have been a real difficult for anyone with Lyme disease. So, you know, so let's start off just a little bit about um, why this is so important for patients is because the way Lyme interacts with your immune system has made it difficult um, for doctors to diagnose you. Um, and just to understand how medicine works, uh, medicine over the last, um, well, especially the last 100 years, 80 years, um, has really focused on the idea that um, there's one cause for uh, someone's illness and um, that cause, if we identify it, uh, we can identify and kill it um, or remove it, all will be well. Now, that model works in infectious disease really well for the bugs that um, get into the wrong places. Okay, so if you have sort of like a pneumococcal infection, you know, um, that's not supposed to be in your lungs. Um, when it gets into your lungs, it's in the wrong place. The body really recognizes that it's in the wrong place. Uh, your immune system reacts appropriately and um, you can cough up some sputum and the doctor can find the bug and we can then treat it. Uh, and your immune system with a little help of the antibiotics will clear it rather rapidly. Even without the antibiotics, the immune system is, uh, if you live, clears the infection nicely. Um, now, Lyme is a different story because Lyme and these other chronic infections, the reason they're chronic is because they have co-evolved with us and they actually want to live in your body. Uh, many things like, you know, when you get a, a staph or a strep infection, those are bugs are happy living on your skin. They really weren't meant to be inside your body. So um, they, they reproduce rather rapidly and they'll kill you if you don't knock them down. Then, but bugs like Lyme, uh, tuberculosis, and also the, all the regular um, co-infections that we talk about, um, co-evolved to live in us, not to kill us. And um, because of that, they uh, have learned to manipulate and evade the immune system. And with Lyme, this starts off right at the beginning. Uh, first of all, Lyme gets a little help from the tick. Uh, when the, the tick has proteins uh, in its uh, salivary glands that it injects, um, when it uh, sticks its little uh, pincers into your body, <laughs> it actually takes a bite out of you. Um, and these immediately lower um, inflammation, okay, locally. Because normally, if you would get a bite of something, you get a large outpouring of, of reactivity from what's called your innate immune system. And the innate immune system, just for a, a quick overview, is things like your neutrophils, um, your neutrophils, your uh, basophils, uh, mast cells, and things called macrophages and monocytes. And you don't have to remember all these things, but it's always nice to hear about them. Um, uh, one thing that's confusing is macrophages and monocytes are really the same cell types. They're just in different locations. The monocyte is floating around in your bloodstream and the macrophage lives in your tissues, but they kind of originate from the same cells. But these are all part of what we call the innate immune system. This is the in part of the immune system that 
recognizes uh, an invader, an intruder, um, just based on uh, on pattern recognition. Uh, uh, it, it's I think one way to think about it. They look at a they recognize cars. They don't know if it's a Toyota or a Lexus or a Mercedes or a Ford. They just know it's a car. Okay. Um, and But this is your first line of defense. Okay. And maybe the most important part of the immune system, because when this fails, um, people don't do well at all. Um, now, this, this innate immune system also contains part of the immune system that we call the complement. And complement are not cells, complement are um, proteins that um, are also activated um, usually by um, by these innate immune uh, by these innate immune cells, but also by um, just reacting to proteins um, on the bacteria. And the complements um, have pathways. There's three different path complement pathways, but the end result for all of them, is they, they poke holes either in the cell that it's been infected or in the bacterial cell and gets them to uh, fall apart. And when that happens, that really um, gives more information for um, the acquired immune system. The acquired immune system are, is your T cells and B cells. Um, and the difference between the acquired immune system and the innate immune system is the acquired immune system develops tools to um, more clearly identify. So they really can tell that it's a Toyota. Uh, um, and what's interesting of how the system works is that first um, antibody that the B cells produce, because B cells are the cells that produce antibodies, um, and they produce Few several different kinds, but the kind the two that we're concerned about today are IgM and IgG, and that IgM is good enough to know that that's a Toyota. Okay, um, it can tell the difference between a Ford and Toyota. Now the IgG can tell the difference probably between the model. Okay, that it's it, it's it's going to know that that's a. Um, uh, a Camry <laughs> versus a Prius, okay? Um, and so it gets, your immune system gets smarter and more more precise and and hopefully more effective uh, as it learns. So it's, it's a learning cascade. I think that's probably uh, the thing to realize. It's, it's not a monolithic system. It's got a lot of steps, a lot of places in it. And each one of these places um, Borrelia has learned to interact with and begin to uh, affect, uh, you know, so um, right away in the beginning, so when the Borrelia gets into the skin, okay, but then it's got to get into the bloodstream to go anyplace else. And that, it, your body's designed to try to stop bugs from getting into your bloodstream. Um, and uh, it, Unfortunately, the Borrelia is able to hijack some of the machinery and, and is able to get these um, cells that we call the macrophages and the monocytes. Um, now, these guys produce chemicals that will um, make your blood vessels more permeable to allow more white blood cells to get into damaged tissue or injured tissue or infected tissue. Um, and what the, But the Borrelia subverts that a little bit and gets them to open up the blood vessels um, where Borrelia wants to go. So it gets initially, it opens up the blood vessels and lets it get into the bloodstream easier. And it also then can work to uh, get into tissues that normally is hard to get into, which is your joints. I mean, the joints are an area that are pretty well sealed, um, but with a little help, from um, the chemicals that the Borrelia produces and, and also uh, kind of hijacking some of your body's own um, chemicals amongst them. I mean, one of the things that we do measure in infections is called MMP9, uh, metalloproteinase 9. Uh, and that's one that um, the, uh, the Borrelia can get the macrophage to release more of, which lets it get into your joints. So, 
Uh, this is a, a bug that has lots and lots of tricks. Okay. Um, now it it also um, releases its own chemicals that will open up those spaces and let the bugs get in because um, Borrelia really wants to get to places where there's poor blood flow because where there's good blood flow, um, there is a lot of immune cells and it, 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 it can survive, but not as well. It does best when it gets into your tissues, which have um, reduced blood flow. And then the Borrelia changes some of its outer surface proteins to be able to hide better from the immune system. Um, so that's the, the first step. Now, along the way, actually kind of early in the beginning, as I said, this complement system is another one. Um, I said there's three pathways in the complement system. So there's three different ways that the complement recognizes an intruder uh, of, of a foreign protein. And unfortunately, um, Borrelia has developed ways of, uh, again, uh, minimizing that. So, and, and when complement is, is low, okay, um, it's harder for the, uh, it's harder for your body to see the invader because what complement does initially, it, it kind of breaks open that invading cell, which will um, expose a lot more antigens, a lot more far antigens being foreign proteins to your immune system. So by evading the complement system, it helps quiet that down. Then we get to what we call the acquired immune system. And this is where things get um, oh, even more, I, I think even more interesting because uh, com the, the acquired immune system is your B cells and T cells, okay? Um, and the first line of defense in the body, in the acquired immune system is the production of the IgM. And as I said, IgM is not that um, good uh, at tagging a cell because that, that's what basically um, antibodies do is antibodies bind to an antigen, which is a protein on the invading cell. And that tags that cell. So other cells like macrophages and other um, white blood cells that we call dendritic cells, which are um, cells that will, once they see an antibody, an antigen complex, they will um, engulf that and they will then take that, in, they will process that information and take the, the antigen part and present it to other T and B cells. And so, because when, uh, when, when the dendritic cell processes the information, um, then the T cells can get activated, okay? Now, and when the T cells get activated, they go to the lymph nodes, okay? Um, where, where the B cells are reproducing and they teach the B cells how to be more precise. And that's when we start to get what we call class switching. When we go from IgM antibodies to IgG antibodies. Okay, and this is so important because this is why um, many of you have been told by infectious disease doctors that you have you don't have Lyme, you have these false positive IgM Western blots, uh, and um, because so um, and so, let me tell you a little story behind this because I think this is one of the more um, frustrating things for uh, patients, but even for doctors, when we try to talk to infectious disease doctors, they'll see our patient results with um, fairly positive IgM Western blots and negative IgG Western blots and say, uh, well, this patient's been sick for um, you know one year, five, for five years. This must be a false positive because in medicine, um, the teaching is that the IgM antibodies kind of dissipate, kind of go away after a few weeks. They go very low um, and your body class switches to IgG. And IgG is the more effective, more specific antibody. Okay. Um, and when the body is responding well to an infection, 
um, you make a lot of B cells that will make a lot of this IgG, it will bind to the, to the bug and will be signaling for the macrophages, um, natural killer cells, um, uh, cytotoxic T cells, a whole group of cells that are designed to recognize this IgG antibody and engulf or kill the, the, the either infected cell or the pathogen, in this case, Borrelia. Now, so here we have um, Lyme has learned how to subvert that. And it's not the only bug that does it, but it's one of the, the few that, that, are, that we see a lot of. And um, because there's most bugs if you, that you get infected with, um, don't do this. Most bugs, um, the IgM disappears within you know a month to two months and you're left with only IgG antibodies. But if we go back um, to what, what happens, what, what Borrelia is able to do is to inhibit that what we call class switching. It gets those T cells to not work correctly. So you have this, you, you have a, actually Borrelia gives a very robust um, IgM immune response. And the people will often actually get, um, you know, swollen lymph nodes uh, with the first infection, not, not quite as big as with Bartonella, but people will get lymph nodes. And, um, but the lymph nodes are filled with B cells making IgM, which is just not that effective. Uh, and they fail to what we call class switch to IgG. Now, what's interesting is clinically, we find when we uh, throw in herbs or antibiotics or something that will help begin to kill um, Borrelia uh, and lower the load in the body, you will then begin to make the correct IgG antibodies. That's because we've interrupted this um, false flag, uh, you can call it, um, operation that the Borrelia has, has been doing, which has been um, kind of giving your T, your T helper cells the wrong signals. So they fail to tell the B cell to switch to IgG. Okay. Um, so this is a, 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 a something that is um, very, very important. I mean, the research is there. I mean, what's frustrating for us as physicians is that this is in the infectious disease literature. It's not that we're making it up, but for some reason, it doesn't seem to get disseminated to the doctors. Um, so we are always arguing that the, the patient does not have a false positive IgM. The patient just has untreated Lyme disease. And after we treat it, you're gonna see that they suddenly have um, positive IgMs. Now, IgGs. Now, the other thing that um, Borrelia does uh, is creates what we call T cell exhaustion. Now that's become a big buzzword um, in the long COVID world uh, because uh, that also happens with long COVID. And in fact, it happens with many chronic infections, infections that your body's not able to clear. And the, the name is, is a little misleading because these T cells are not tired it's not that there's, um, that what, what's happened is your body is trying to protect its organs, you know, because if you have um, a bug that is living in your organs and keeps creating inflammatory response, but the inflammatory response, the, uh, the attacking, um, I said, the cytotoxic T cells, the uh, natural killer cells, the macrophages, um, and, uh, you know, the, these are the ones that actually go in there and will kill something. Uh, if those keep going um, at an infection, in, at, a, at, an, at infected cells in your organs, but don't actually manage to clear them, to really kill them, they'll damage the organ. So your body makes a, a little bit of a, 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 a truce with the bugs. It lets them stay there. Well, it doesn't have much of a choice. It doesn't really let them stay there. <laughs> Since we haven't been able to clear the bug, uh, the immune system makes a choice and, really, and starts producing many chemicals. Uh, one of them, the big one, 
it is called PD-1, which is program cell death one, uh, which has many functions in the body. But one of the things that it does is it modulates the immune response and it changes your T cell um, presentation to one that is down-regulating the immune response, okay? Uh, instead of trying, instead of um, causing more uh, cell, more uh, cells to go and attack the tissue, it starts to tell them to be, okay, the war is not over, but it's simmering down. So stop fighting so hard. Because if you keep creating a lot of uh, inflammation, you create a lot of oxidative stress, you're gonna hurt the organ. So the body makes the choice to learn to live with low grade infection. Now, the downside of this is that you survive, but you don't function as well. You know, um, often you are left with uh, too many inflamed cells, maybe in your liver, uh, often in your joints, uh, in your nervous system. You know, so you can create a myriad of, of chronic symptoms uh, that that maybe cause a lot of pain and discomfort, but really aren't causing tissue damage anymore. And, and in fact, I think that's often the good news is that so many people who have severe symptomatology, I mean, like, you know, terrible um, neuropathies and uh, as you all probably know, brain fog and, um, you know, just even, and even intermittent joint pain. But yet when we do clear the infection, often the system comes back online and, and there really hasn't been real um, damage to the organs. And that's, you know, because your body has chosen to have a truce. You know, and one of the reasons why you get such big herxes is that when we go in with antibiotics um, and we start to kill more bugs, well, then the dying bugs create enough inf new inflammatory signals that um, your body again gets its full uh, attack mode going, you know, and um, that can be painful. Okay, now, so hopefully we're always trying to balance that um, so we don't get your immune system to do too much damage um, while it's trying to kill the bugs, and um, and this goes back to um, you know what we always, what we uh, what I'm sure you've heard about in the early in some of the other segments of our of our series is how important, um, you know, detox, uh, making, making sure the nutrition is good um, and, and making sure that the, you, we, can get, we can keep some balance in this inflammatory response. So um, it, just to kind of sum up is that when you're fighting Borrelia, it's not a, a zero sum game. It's not something we can just go in there and knock it all out once it's established itself. You know, in the early days of infection, um, yeah, you go in there with uh, um, with antibiotics, or I have to say, many people's own immune system is able to get past all these little um, uh, steps that the Borrelia takes. Because remember, I said the Borrelia co-evolves, so it's going after weaknesses in our system. But um, for instance, in the comp I mean, any one of these systems, the complement system, the T cells, the B cells, you've got tons of genes that are programming for this, and they all have lots of SNPs, these single nucleotide um, polymorphisms. So you might have a complement system that is fairly resistant to Borrelia's games, and then you'll knock that bug out pretty quick. On the other hand, if your complement system has a few genes that are working uh, on a little slower, a, a little, you know, uh, not quite so aggressive, uh, then the Borrelia might, might have a chance at getting a much bigger um, uh, toehold and eventually just be able to set up shop inside your body. And so that's the thing, because remember, the all, all these SNPs, um, at least most of them that have been around a while that are fairly popular in the genome uh, serve a purpose because it would be if, if you have all your guns blazing too easily when you get an infection, you very often can actually cause tissue damage enough that you're going to hurt yourself. 
you know, that you're going to get long-term scarring in important organs or just, you know, excessive inflammation that's, that, will, that will kill enough cells that you might get scarring or just loss of function. So it's all about balance. Um, and that's what makes this such a difficult bug um, to treat because the balance is about your body. Um, you know, and we often have tools that are a little on the gross side that don't always take into account your um, genetic and biochemical individuality. And that's where the hard work of treating people who have been ill for a while is finding what your body needs. And, and, and I, you know, what we're lucky that most people can do the um, ABCD protocols and get better. But if you're one of them that doesn't, it's because there are, um, if it's not the toxin load in your system, it's these slight variations in how your immune system has learned to dance with the bug. And um, we keep hoping to find ways to, um, you know, be able to like increase like get maybe in some people you, they need their natural killer cells goosed up a little bit. In other people, um, we need to um, you know maybe get the complement system to be a little bit better. In some folks, uh, it's just getting um, this class switching to happen. Um, and again, there's no straightforward ways of doing this, unfortunately. But that's where um, a lot of using herbs. Uh, and uh, and some of the supplements to that we that we know will will push different parts of the system, and then we put them inside you and see what happens. Um, so this is uh, the the classic the classic um, dilemma with treating chronic uh, or persistent Lyme is uh, how much how much to do and how fast to do it. Okay. Um, so let's go to, and uh, let's go to questions, I think. And, um, and I, cause I, I, I don't want to, the, the, the issue with talking about the immune system is details, details, details. Um, and then it gets to the point where, um, unless you're an immunologist, um, you totally confused. And to be honest, even the immunologists get confused. I, just one other, I think, important part I want to uh, remind people about is that um, the immune system is constantly, uh, we're learning about it. It is such a complex uh, system. Uh, every week, every month, we learn about um, new subclasses of T cells and B cells and um, uh, different different types of natural killer cells. Um, because ju just by small variations on what proteins they express on their cell surface, they interact with other cells slightly differently. Um, and this is an area of just it's ongoing research, but at this point, there's so many details that we need. Um, this is where AI might really come in handy because the complexity can be overwhelming. So let's go to some questions. I'll put my glasses on so I can see something. All right. Um, Dr. Byrne, do you want to read them or do you want me to? Let me give you, I'll just give you the first one. Um, it's a Lee has a long uh, explanation of uh, being diagnosed with Lyme, but thinks that um, they actually contracted Lyme when they were diagnosed with Hashimoto's twelve years ago. Can you please comment on the relationship between Lyme and Hashimoto's? Okay. Well, um, Interesting. I don't know directly. All I can say is a lot of our patients uh, tend to have both. And is that because, uh, you know, maybe, um, you know, they had a little leaky guts to begin with and their immune systems were getting a little taxed beforehand. I mean, there, there are probably lots of causes of Hashimoto's. Um, you know, one of the more, uh, we think, common ones is uh, the connection between uh, celiac or not necessarily celiac even, but just uh, a leaky gut and uh, increasing uh, the tendency 
for Hashimoto's. Um, but that being said, once you get Lyme, um, you very well might have uh, increased antibodies to lots of bugs. Okay, and not and, and in your case, it, it's it's your um, it's your thyroid, uh, but it, it might not even be attacking the thyroid that much. Um, it's just a question of these B cell clones um, tend to lose. Um, lose their controlling their their controlling arm that's be that's usually the t cells okay um because the i mean what we see often uh is people who have lyme who have very elevated uh antibodies to ebv uh hh6 cmv you know and that's why many of these people have been diagnosed as having uh chronic fatigue syndrome and um as a group well, over the years, I remember oh, 20 years ago, Dr. Anderson and I would always be trying to figure out which, which is on top, you know, because there are some people that you treat their viral load and you have a little easier shot at their Lyme. Most of the time we found that you really had to go after the Lyme first. And often when you get rid of the Lyme, the um, all those elevated antibodies come down because again we really weren't dealing with an infection we were just dealing with um, your ability to control your B cells was it was lost because of the effect of Lyme on T cells so I hope that's not too confusing but um, so it's a circle T cells and B cells communicate um, and when uh, if your T cells aren't telling your 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 B cells what to do correctly, they're gonna go off and keep making too many antibodies. Uh, when they're making too many antibodies, they can um, disrupt the T cells. So we have to break the chain to get you better. How might an underlying immune condition like mannose binding lectin deficiency change your approach to treating a patient with chronic and severe symptoms of Lyme and co-infections? Um, not as much as I would like it. It just tells us, it just tells us that, um, that, that, that the complement system is probably not going to be working as well. Um, and we, uh, have to be a little more, probably we might have to, um, go after them a little harder with antibiotics than we, than I would like to, um, but it, it, to be honest, it's something that I haven't, that though I, I, my uh, compatriots, the neurologists are all, and immunologists are all measuring the mannose binding lectin a lot, and we do see it low, but uh, I, unfortunately, I, I, don't, I haven't found anything that is particularly going to uh, change that, because again, this is just how your immune system you know, um, works. It, it, it's just got a little blind spot, um, and luckily, the system is redundant enough that that this by itself um, doesn't usually cause a lot of problems until there are other infections. But there was a, a a question that I see right top that I would like to um, that's that, that about false positives. Um, okay. Uh, Yeah, I, I, I'm not exactly sure of the question. I just don't think, when it comes to Igenex, um, I haven't seen, I mean, again, it's hard to tell if somebody has a false positive, but um, <laughs> in, in general, um, the thing that could be confusing on Igenex testing is that you might have a very positive uh, IgG uh, and uh, perhaps you just have, uh, you, you clear the infection fairly well and your immune system hasn't settled down yet. It doesn't really tell us. When I have a very positive IgG on, um, uh, on the uh, Igenex test, and especially when we've treated the person and that, that, that IgG is staying very positive, that's when I would like to do, uh, I often use InfectoLab, who, which does T-cell testing to um, take a look because the specific T-cell clones or subsets, not really clones, the specific T cell subsets that um, they look at in InfectoLab are only the ones that produce something called interferon gamma are only in the bloodstream 
when your body is actively fighting something. Okay, so that's why I, I don't use it as a screening test because if if Lyme is there, but it very, but it's fairly quiescent, you might have a negative infecto lab test. Well, you'll still have a po a, a a positive um, uh, Western blot or immunoblot. But if the immunoblot is very high, it is very positive, um, and I treat you. Uh, I like to, and you know, I'll, I'll often check the Infecto Lab and see if that's positive, and that we can follow because that will go negative pretty quickly within like two or three months if the Lyme is actually gone. Um, Vibrant, I, 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 I like their toxin labs. I'm not, I'm not a, 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 a fan of their, um, their bug tests. Uh, I, I just, yeah, I just think they, they're, they're. They find a lot of positives I'm not sure about. Um, so that's just my bias at this mo at this point in time. Uh, and it's a very good question. Um, you know, I'm going to have to look more into how to supporting low complement because I really don't know off the top of my head. That's something I should know. So I'll I'll, I'll do my homework on that one. <laughs> um, uh, Okay. Dr. Gordon, make sure you're reading the question so they know what you're answering. Um, okay. Well, it was a good one. It was, when do you work on rebuilding a patient's immune system before, during, or after killing the Lyme and co-infections? Well, I'd like to say, uh, for most people, before, if we can. You know, um, the issue you run into is that um, if you um, use... Um, some of the herbs to help stimulate the immune system and somebody uh, is not able to modulate their immune response well, um, you you get into trouble. And I'll, let, me, let me be a little more specific here. I just realized a nice way to explain this. Um, we always used to like to start off with herbs. Okay. In fact, you know, one of the, for, you know, in the beginning, uh, many years ago, we, we were using a ton of, of Byron White's herbs, you know, and they're really powerful things. They're wonderful. Um, but we'd find that a lot of people would, would really flare, would quote unquote, have these big herxes. Um, because most of the herbal, the, the beauty of the herbs is they don't only kill things, they do support the immune system. I mean, that's the beauty of the, the, the magic of the complexity of, of working with plants is that um, they, again, they, they co-evolved with us and somehow they have a relationship with, with, with our beings and they don't just do one thing. And so um, one of the lessons that I've learned is that, you know, when people react badly um, to the herbs, those are the people who often will do okay with antibiotics, especially IV antibiotics, which is kind of, it, it, it's, and it's not always the easiest sell because you, you know, if you take in a few drops of an herbal tincture and are significantly flared, it's hard to believe that you're gonna do well on an antibiotic. But the point is that you often do because the antibiotic will actually kill the bug. And it, it if we have your detox pathways working a little bit, and and for that, I, I'm I'm very big on, of course, making sure that the blood flow and the lymph drainage is good in your body, and that means usually a lot of structural work as well. But when that's working, we can go in there with antibiotics and help lower the load of bugs, okay, and not cause such a big herx, because for for the antibiotics, the herx is is more often your body's ability to um, get rid. Of the of the of the toxic byproducts. While when we go in there with herbs, because most of the herbs are designed to truly activate and increase your own immune response. Um, and if the Borrelia has, you know, if you happen to be the people with the right genetics, that the Borrelia has subverted your immune system, you're going to hurt badly um, because we're going to turn up your immune system and uh, and. and and so that's the the very interesting and in, in my mind counterintuitive uh, lesson. Um, and I I I I must say I learned that the hard way. <laughs>
um because i, I um you know, un, until um until i saw the difference when people actually tolerated the antibiotics so let's let's see um yeah. Oh, okay. So, and, and that kind of said the same thing. Do I want to be enhancing my immune system if I have an autoimmune disease since it is overly active? Uh, okay. Um, well, that's the point. The reason that you often have an autoimmune disease is because, um, in, in the context of Lyme especially, is because Lyme has been playing with your immune system. It has dysregulated. So um, you are making more and more antibodies um, without um, balancing, with, with, without getting those T reg cells to work appropriately, which can damp down the system. Okay. So um, again, this is an example of where, no, I wouldn't give you a lot of immune stimulating things. I would try to kill the bugs. In the context, I said, of making sure your detox is working. So, so there's, we we have to parse out when the when the symptoms are coming from excess inability for your body to get rid of inflammatory uh, chemicals um, and breakdown products versus when you are turning up your immune system and you're just making a lot of you're making a lot of inflammatory chemicals that are um, causing your symptoms. So uh, that's where detox, detox, detox. And um, I mean, and, and that that's where, uh, you know, I, my, my evolutionary approach, I, I always tell the story that, you know, I, I was very hesitant to start treating Lyme at, 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 you know, like in 1998, 99, 2000, I was, wasn't going to go near Lyme uh, because, you know, the tests weren't great and I was going to put people on antibiotics for a clinical diagnosis. Mm, it wasn't for me. I didn't want to hurt people like that. Mm. And it was only as I saw more and more people that uh, I was, Dr. Anderson started to work with me and I saw more and more people who he was treating and they clearly got better when we treated the Lyme. Then I realized how important it was to treat Lyme. But we also had a fair number of people who we treated the line and they got sicker. And over the years, we kept talking about detox, 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 and we did it. But in the last five to seven years, um, especially since, um, you know, Dr. Parpia has joined us and has um, shown us what you can do because we always talked about detox, okay? And we did some, but... Um, she has a radical approach of sometimes detoxing people for sometimes a year before actively treating. And I was always too impatient. <laughs> but now I can tell you that in people who, who do have a lot of autoimmune problems, a lot of, um, and who react really strongly to treatment, that is the way to go. You know, it's the detox pathways, cl you know, cleaning that up as much as you can um, that will allow you to get better. Now, you don't always have to wait a year, but just but you have to make sure that the detox is the main is the main thing you're doing with intermittent killing rather than um, sort of the classic eyelids approach of go in there and kill the bugs. You know, so, it, it, and and it's just, this is why these things have to be tailored to your body. Um, so if you're someone with autoimmune disease, um, the detox is going to be important because anything that causes the inflammatory chemicals to go up may may push your system. And, 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 and I just want to say one other thing about autoimmune disease. Autoimmune disease is not a disease of an excessively active immune system. It's a disease of a poorly controlled, balanced immune system. You've got underactive components of your immune system there as well. The immune the T regs are, are often suppressed. And so it's not like um, your immune system is working over, at overtime. It's just not working in balance. So long answer, I apologize for that. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. And so if antibiotics are needed to treat Lyme and Bartonella, 
how do we keep the good bacteria in the gut and elsewhere while on antibiotics? Do you think pulsing is a good solution? Well, um, yes, <laughs> I think pulsing is the solution. Um, I, 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 I mean, it's not, first of all, you're going to trash your gut. I mean, if you're using antibiotics, it's your gut is going to take a toll. Um, I, for one, am a great, I, I prefer pulsing intravenous antibiotics when I can, because even though that still does get the gut, it just doesn't get it as much. Um, and we we have to, rebuilding after treatment is a big component of, of truly healing from Lyme. There's no question about that. Um, but the good news is, is that especially when we treat intermittently, um, the the gut the gut flora is amazingly resilient. The problem we have is that many times by the time you have chronic Lyme, your gut flora is already fairly dysbiotic. Okay, um, it, you you you've lost the balance because um, there's a, there's a good chance that um, your body might have dealt with the Lyme on its own if you didn't have the low level chronic inflammation from a dysbiotic gut flora to begin with, because you live in America, you've been eating, I mean, eating, even if you're eating organic food, it's just, you there's just such a toxic load to the gut in America um, that it's hard to find guts that are really healthy. But, um, but those of you, those of us who probably didn't have pristine diets for our whole lives, um, you start off with a fairly dysbiotic leaky gut. And that's probably what what disabled what what further disabled your immune system to let you get sick in the first place. So going back, yes, we got to fix your gut, but we have to um, sometimes have to live with that uh, and um, do our best to support it. Try to keep it as healthy, and it's not so much pouring the uh, the the um, the probiotics in there. It's really about the prebiotics and the right diet. Uh, that's going to do your best to keep your gut as healthy as possible, even with the antibiotic load. Um, so, um, yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Oh, so somebody asked the question that 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 cemento product cemento products greatly increase my nerve pain all over, and I think that's one of the issues. It, that I was talking about is that the herbs are um, immune activators. And um, though many people try to balance the herbal formulas, they often do tend to cause quite a flare. So my favorite thing is, you know, if people can, it's nice to start with the herbs, but if the herbs flare symptoms, I go to the antibiotics and save the herbs for the cleanup. Okay, because when you lower the load of the line, then the herbs will work well. And they're, I, you know, I would, of course, much rather have to treat you with maybe three to six months of antibiotics and maybe a year, year and a half of herbs, because that to me is a much safer um, for your whole body. Um, And yeah, Bartonella co-infections um, probably can can definitely can do the same, can affect, I, um, oh, but this is IgM levels depressed. That I don't know. I don't know if it, if it lowers IgM levels. Um, again, generally people with low IgMs, unless they're very low, um, if they don't have a history of lots of infections, do quite do quite well. Um, borderline low IgM levels, we, we, we tend to, um, you know, doesn't, don't tend to cause a lot of, of illness because remember that's something that, that you have your innate immune system is pretty powerful and the IgM is, is there, but um, as long as you can have enough IgM to uh, get into your, um, your germinal centers, that's in your lymph nodes, um, the B cells there will start making IgG and that will usually keep you going. Uh, the same immune cells involved in autoimmunity are those involved in, uh, oh, in, in infection. Um, 
Well, yeah, it's one big system. The autoimmunity has many flavors, okay, uh, in the sense that there are autoimmune illnesses that people think of as being more B cell dominant or more T cell dominant. Um, yeah, mo most of them, uh, most yeah, autoimmune diseases in general um, are diseases of the acquired immune system. That's your T cells and B cells, the lymphocytes. Okay, um, and those are very important in, in in dealing with infection. But that being said, this is a system. Um, you know, we always thought, um, what was it? Um, yeah, MS. This is years ago. Was felt to be a T cell disease, and yet when they killed all the B cells with rituxan, uh, there was um, you know recovery um, from from MS or or at least you know MS stopped progressing in patients um, because the point is the body is. Um, circles upon circles cycles upon cycles upon cycles there's no linearity in the body. OK, this concept that one cell is doing one thing, just it, our minds love that idea, but that's just not how the body works. OK, your T cells and B cells um, control each other. OK, there's no one you don't have a T cell disease or a B cell disease. You have a failure of of communication. And it's the same thing. The innate immune system modulates the T cell and B cell response. If the innate immune system isn't working in the beginning, you're not going to get an effective B cell and then T cell response. So, um, yeah. And, and it's just, so we basically. Um, by definition, autoimmune diseases are about the acquired immune system. But if your innate immune system is not working well, you're going to have a much higher chance of developing an autoimmune disease because the initial signals to the, to the T cells and B cells are not going to be clear. And when you have muddy signals, you tend to get a imbalanced or, or a, a response that doesn't turn off. Okay, because this is these are cycles. They turn on, they should reach a crescendo, and then they should be coming down because other counter-regulatory uh, chemicals are being are being released by other parts of the immune system. So, yeah, it, it's hard because when we're sick, we want it to be simple. It's not, um, but within this complexity, we're still able to um, get somewhere. <laughs> but um, I hope I'm not confusing. I always think I confuse people because it's all circles. Okay. Is it too late? Yeah, 21 year fighter of Lyme here. Is it too late to consider antibiotics? Well, it depends. Um, love that answer. It always depends. Um, you know, it, antibiotics can still be helpful. I mean, they're not going, after 21 years, there probably is some tissue damage. There's some organs that are going to be injured that may not come back completely, but um, you very well might get some response. Um, you know, but again, if you've been ill for 21 years, there's a lot of support needed. And, and that's where that detox thing comes in. Um, and, you know, I, I, it, it just depends on level of function. You know, people who've been ill for 21 years, but are still able to get a few good hours out of a day, um, you know, detox should roll pretty smoothly with you. Um, if you're somebody who basically your day consists of, you know, going from your bed to the bathroom to maybe sitting up for an hour, um, well then detox is probably going to be difficult because we've got a lot of work to do to get the blood flow and the lymph drainage going, there's going to be lots of places where um, your body has kind of hidden, uh, hidden a lot of garbage, so to speak. Because when you're sick, you don't take out the garbage. Uh, and so after 21 years, there's going to be a lot of detox. But I wouldn't, I would definitely consider antibiotics once you've done a little cleaning up. Okay. What are clues someone has over? De I don't know if you can over detox, but or nearing the point of overly clearing out the body, which creates an own issue of depleting a deficient. Ah, well, you know, this is where balance comes in, and and you know, and 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 probably doing a little more measuring of of what's going on. Um, 
and, and I come back to this area of, of IVs, you know, I mean, for robust people, I don't think IVs are that important. I mean, I'm somebody who's been, dis, you know, I've got some internal organ stuff that is not so healthy, but I've been blessed and I've never really been sick and IVs don't do much for me. You know, <laughs> I've had access to them for 20 years and, um, or 20, what, 30 years I've had IVs and uh, I'm kind of like, you know, eh, do a Myers, I don't notice anything. But if you are deficient, IVs are life-changing, okay? Often have to go very slowly with them, but because we have to get the um, deficient, often minerals first into the tissues. And there is just something about the the, the load the, the of getting it into the bloodstream through an IV that you cannot do orally. So if you're deficient, um, I would work with somebody who can really do it, do our best and our tests are getting better at measuring deficiencies in different different ways and supporting that through IV therapy um, to build you up uh, because yeah, it, it, that that's not a good thing. Okay. Um, Okay, somebody asked prior to beginning chronic Lyme treatment, um, would it be universally useful to do a prehab with biofilm treatment and GI microbiome supplementation, you know, pre and probiotics? Is this something a patient could do prior to seeing a Lyme literate doctor? Well, um, I'm not big on biofilm busting until you've treated. Okay, I mean, again, and, and the world is full of opinions, but I've seen too many people who um, decide to break open biofilms and get really sick because, I mean, the biofilms are where the bugs are hiding, but it's also protecting you, okay? Um, so if you're having symptoms from the load in your body, you don't want to expose your immune system to more of the bug, uh, okay, until you're ready for it. So I personally don't think, I think biofilms should be dealt with uh, down the road, um, after we've established some control of the infection, uh, you know, building up your gut, I think is fine. Again, uh, I, I'm, I'm not as big on the probiotics is, I, I mean, I, I said, I've, I've been trying to treat guts for 30 years and, um, I, I'm coming down, uh, to the point that if it's a chronic pro problem, you really have, it's, it's diet and um, you know, colostrum if it's tolerated. It's just the 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 things the 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 stuff that creates a good neighborhood in your gut. Okay, it, throwing the bugs in is, doesn't usually do a lot until you've created at least a a, a a nice safe neighborhood. So and and that that takes a little thought and a little work. Okay, any do we have time for one more here? Yes, one more. Um, helped. Ah, okay. Well, real, oh, there's two that I would love. Oh, man, these are good, great questions here. Um, <laughs> okay, um, I'll, I'll take this one. If a patient has a bad case of persistent Lyme and severe adrenal insufficiency, what are the pros and cons of supplementing the adrenals with steroids when the Lyme is active and the immune system unbalanced? Well, I think if you're using low doses of hydrocortisone um, carefully and you don't use that to do more than you should, I think that's appropriate. Okay, I, I mean, there are exceptions to every rule. Um, you know, I, I, I don't like using prednisone um, to get people through herxes. I mean, I know that some people are doing that and that's, I, I don't think that's a wise thing to do in general. Um, but if people really do have a significant, you know, adrenal insufficiency where, you know, they're just exhausted in the morning and their cortisols are really low. And um, even if their ACTH is pumping, um, I think there's no harm in trying very low doses, 1.25, 2.5, 5, maybe 10 milligrams of hydrocortisone in the morning. Uh, as long as that, as long as you use that to support your system, you know, what I don't want you to is to take those things and then try to do three more activities in the day. Okay. Cause that's not going to work, but we want to get it. So you're not stressing your body more 
to do what it needs to do. And to me, that's the beauty of the low dose hydrocortisone. It's not replacing what your body is making. It's supporting you. It, it, it's, it's like giving somebody a walking stick. Okay. Um, I don't want to give you a wheelchair. You know, I just want to support you a little bit so you don't stumble uh, and, and, and fall and, and get hurt more. Because if we keep taxing your body um, while we're trying to kill a bug, we can make you sicker. So that's what, yes. So the right amount, support. And that's where you need a good doctor who's done this a while, who can make sure that you're just supporting yourself. You're not artificially inflating your ability to function. Okay. Um, I want to start doing, okay. I want to get to, the, I know we're done, but this is a great question I want to get to real quickly. What to start doing when mostly a bedridden patient? <laughs> and um, sun, uh, sun exposure, uh, movement in bed, have somebody move you if you can't, but movement, sun, um, obviously love and attention, but you know the, the problem with being a bed a bedridden patient is that no matter how much the people around you love you, they can be getting to the point of a little frustration taking care of you. So, but if you can, I think the more that you can do to accept the love in the help that people are giving, and even when they're a little irritated with you, or or you can tell they're frustrated because they'd rather be living their lives but still know and feel their love and give them some love back. Um, that's immense because, you know, but getting back to the physical things is exposure to sunlight. Um, you know, any kind of movement you can, you can do or that can be done to you. Uh, you know, some of the, um, the FSM, some of the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, pulse electro, uh, the PMF, mats if you can tolerate them. The problem I have is that some of my really bed-bound patients, those are too much stimulation. But if you can tolerate them, those are nice ways to begin to begin to energize the body a little bit. But movement, 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 anything you can do that can have you move more, um, have you sit up if possible as much as 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 much as possible, you know, using um uh, you know, they have these you know, support, sto support stockings are terrible. Nobody can put, by the time they get them on you, you're exhausted. But they have like things like jet boots where you can zip up and they pressurize and that might let you sit up. And of course, you know, I don't know. I'm assuming, I'm always, not everybody who's bed bound is there because they're, um, they have orthostatic hypotension. But if that's the case, anything you can do to, to maximize that, there are medications that, to help some people quite a bit if they tolerate them. So anyway, but movement, love, sun, uh, it, 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 you know, music, anything that can that can make your body real feel alive, because that's where it has to start from. You know, once you've been in bed a while, um, it, it, especially with an infection like this, it, it, it it's hard. But uh, you know, anything you can do to uh, get your mind more excited and, and alive is, is really important. And of course, um, IVs can really help sometimes, but that's hard to do if you're bed bound because you're home. Anyway, I, I'm so, I wish so many good questions. Um, uh, um, and somebody's asking about more gallons and all I can tell people is that, you know, uh, in our experience, um, the, it, you, treating the Lyme is good, but it, it, it's the parasite treatments are, are the thing that you, that usually move the needle. Um, it, it, it's not just a dermatological manifestation of, of, of Lyme, uh, or co-infection. Uh, it's its own thing and, uh, really going after it with, with the anti-parasite things along with Lyme treatment, um, is useful. So, Blessings, thank you all for um, your attention.